We have uh, wonderful curators and programmers from around the world here to talk about their work. And I would like to introduce uh, the host of this panel, Scotty Lois, who works for the Department of Media Studies at the University of Rostock, uh, also works for the Lesbe Schule Filmtag in Hamburg, uh, co-founded the Film Festival Research Network and also organized a wonderful conference on queer film culture last year in Hamburg, which was which served as an inspiration for this panel. And please welcome Scotty. everybody for um, still being here. It's been a long day already and it's kind of hard to come on as fangirls and boys after Christine Vachon. Um, so, you know, bear with us. Um, the children. <laughs> um, this morning we already talked about um, reimagining queer archives and there was already, you know, a bit of overlap being produced or bridges being built to our panel um, back then, and um, right now we're going to talk about queer film festivals in practice, and we're going to um, focus mostly on curating and um, programming issues. Um, as has also been mentioned uh, this morning already by Wieland, um, and is also in the brochure, um, queer film festivals have been around for nearly four decades now. That's a long time, since the 70s. Uh, when the first uh, queer film series and single event started and then the first festival that's still existing uh, frame line came about in 1977. Um, since then more than 330 queer festivals have been established uh, over the years. Several have faltered again because um, of burnout, no finances or, you know, like just um, falling apart for other reasons, but been replaced by new and other ones. There are currently about 260 uh, active queer film festivals in the world. That's a lot. That's a whole own circuit. And on the panel, we tried to come up with a good mix of people, of backgrounds, of different uh, ages of festivals. We have the oldest festival, the big you know, representational burden being put on desk <laughs> later on. Um, we have um, programmers and directors of very young festivals that have only been happening for a year or two. And we have the middle-aged ones and um, those that um, are not called queer, but, you know, are the sex-positive ones, like uh, the, the Pond Film Festival. So there's going to be a range, and I'm going to introduce every person on stage very briefly and um, get a little question for them, and then um, hopefully we have a time for a round of, you know, a couple of questions on, on the podium here, and then open up um, so everybody else gets a chance to talk as well. So let me start. Um, with um, Des Beaufort, she's the um, director of programming and exhibition for Frameline, which, as I said, is the oldest LGBT, now new Q, LGBTQ, um, a film festival, Frameline, so welcome for being here. And um, I would... Yes. Um, I think it's quite obvious as the oldest festival that there is a long history, a lot of changes. It's known for being a very multifaceted but also very vocal community in San Francisco. You know, like over the, the history there have been a few revolutions, if you will, you know, like the famous lesbian riot in the 80s. And then I remember vividly the discussion about the gender cater um, and trans inclusion and stuff. So I, I would like you to talk a bit about maybe the challenges and the burden of representation for such a big festival. Thanks for having me, uh, Scotty. So um, as Scotty mentioned, uh, Framelines in San Francisco, and we were started in 1977 by a group of gay filmmakers who decided to organize a public screen of their work. Uh, they organized an event at a community center and pinned up a bedsheet as the screen, and that was the first festival. 
Um, since then, um, and in the few years after that uh, festival, we also saw a proliferation of other identity-based festivals happening in the San Francisco Bay Area. We had um, the United States, uh, we had the first Jewish Film Festival, we had the first Latino Film Festival, we also had the first Asian American Film Festival with the United States all start in that same community. They were all uh, artist-driven. So in terms of, of burden of representation, um, I, I mention that because we, we've always wanted to center the work of the artist since we were started by the artist. Uh, in addition to um, being in what's perceived as kind of a mecca uh, for and refuge for LGBTQ people worldwide, it, it really does lend itself to be a very multifaceted, um, diverse number of LGBTQ communities that come not only to our festival, but just in terms of um, our, our colleagues and our programmers that come from all over the world as well. So in terms of the burden of representation, it's hard because there, as we all know, there's no one monolithic queer community or lesbian community. There's so many different intersections, especially when we're looking around race, class, gender expression, privilege. So um, it's, it's hard because in any given year, there's not always the content that we would like to have to serve all those communities. So we also have the burden of um, getting creative and centering content. So if perhaps if I don't have um, a particularly strong um, feature about a uh, quarter of color, I might get creative and um, create a retrospective, create a shorts program. But it's, it's challenging because there's so many vocal opinions and we want to be as inclusionary as possible and also continue to center quality work and dynamic storytelling. Thanks. Um, for everybody who might wonder wh what um, order I follow, I, I follow this one. So I'm just I'm not gonna go by the way everybody's seated, just you know, by by this um, 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 list in the program. Um, next up we have Joao Ferreira. Uh, he is the artistic director uh, of Queer Lisboa. Uh, he's also an actor, playwright, university teacher. Um, um, has been traveling uh, a lot and talking about Lisboa also. Um, so welcome, uh, Joao, first of all. <laughs> what I find very interesting about Lisboa is that you guys um, always have a very um, specific uh, programming, it's very art driven, and I know um, you guys also put out a book um, uh, two years ago on queer film culture. So it's it's a constant discussion and your festival what queer cinema actually is. Maybe you can say a few sentences about that. Yeah, um, we. I'll just give a, a very quick context. Uh, the festival is running for 20 years this year. It started in uh, 97. And um, although it was born at the time inside uh, a gay and lesbian association, um, three years later it became independent. And I think from, from that moment we, uh, we started working um, for a very broad audience. What also helped was that we were the first film festival in Lisbon. We were the only film festival for many years. So it was kind of a, an imposition from the outside that we screened uh, that our, our films were not only uh, gay, lesbian or trans. That we, we, we had to open. And that, that I think really helped uh, the festival to, to develop in this, uh, in this way that, that you're saying. So, we, we, we never, we're never so much worried about does it have uh, an LGBT narrative, content, or anything, but how, how do I, as a queer individual, look at this film? So that's, that's our perspective, really, on, the, on, the, on queer cinema. Yeah, let's start. Thanks. I, I think we're going to come back to that discussion about what is queer and what context, but that's a very good um, starting point. Next up, we have Alexandra uh, Karastoyan um, from Bucharest in uh, Romania. 
Um, she is a filmmaker and also a human rights activist, um, founding member of a trans activism NGO and the director of the first feminist and queer international film festival in Bucharest. Well, thank you for having me. So, as I said earlier, there's a, a vast number of queer festivals out there, so, you know, one of the questions is why have another one and why have one that's called feminist and queer? What's, what's the idea behind it? Well, um, first I, I need to underline the fact that um, Romania is a very orthodox country, so I think that says a lot. So, it actually started as a, a response, let's say, to something that happened in 2012. We wanted to screen The Kids Are All Right at the Paisons Museum, uh, and there were maybe maximum 10 people from the community wanting to watch the film. And the screening was boycotted by uh, around 50 Orthodox uh, and uh, religious and like anti-LGBT uh, group. So that was like the starting point. Uh, there's, there wasn't any, even though there is one festival now, Next Film Festivals, which, which screens LGBT films, back then, back then, well, two years, three years ago, there wasn't any. So uh, then I went to Tel Aviv and I saw amazing things happening there and I said, well, let's, let's do this in Bucharest. We need this. We need the people to see themselves. You can't just download films off of the internet and watch them. It's, people need to see themselves on the big screen. So yeah, that's basically the reason why we started it. And, and what's the, the extra edition of The Feminist? Uh, I would say it's more of a personal thing. I started working for a feminist uh, sex education uh, video uh, YouTube vlogging and it kind of opened uh, the, the, the information about the fact that women are underrepresented, uh, that in Romania violence is a, a really big issue. More than, uh, statistics said, say that more than 60% of Romanians think that violence is unjustified. So, and they would never, I mean, if, if, if uh, they would hear a quarrel uh, near, like in, in the neighborhood, they would never go in and say, this is not supposed to happen. Like if a woman is bitten in the street, nobody's gonna intervene. And that's the reason why we also said feminist and, and queer, yeah. Thank you. Then we have Zhao Gong Wei from the Beijing Queer Film Festival. He's the director of the festival now. He's also a trained actor and works for theater, is also an activist and uh, uh, has worked for several different NGOs related to LGBT issues. Um, he's also the executive director of the Beijing Gender Health Education Institute and um, also works with the LGBT webcast Queer Comrades. So, very active uh, person. Um, at the same time, oh, I also forgot, Alexandra is also on the Teddy Jury this year, uh, just as uh, Zhou Gang is. Um, and um, several people might know a bit about the situation of the Beijing International Queer Film Festival because there also has been a documentary about it a few years back. Um, so there is an awareness of the problems with censorship and you know, um, state and government interference with running that particular film festival but also other film festivals. Um, Maybe we can talk a bit about the creativity to put on a queer film festival despite those censorship issues and, and interventions. Hi everyone, if you do understand what I'm talking about. I have to say sorry, my English is not my like, uh, first language, so if you don't understand, raise your hand, I will repeat again. And uh, yes, uh, I would say that Beijing Curfing Festival, uh, I think, to be honest, we always have a, 
uh, audience want to see the films. And, and it's not very difficult for, our, for us to program in this. There's a lot of films want to come to Beijing Korea Film Festival. But the, our big challenge, of course, with our authority, I think, is uh, to have a place to show the film is very difficult. So it's been past three years. We kind of go this very guerrilla style. So we kind of like, uh, pick 10 plays. And we each place will probably just put one film. If that film being shutting down, does they still have the other night place can show the films? So we even put like a, we even organize like a uh, screen the film on the bus, and we take a train from one place to the other place. We show the film on the train. Everybody have bring their computer, so we give their like a you know this uh, sticker, so they can show the film on the train from one stop to the other stop. So yeah, we sort of use a lot of different ways to show the film. But I have to say, which is sometimes is also kind of missing when I. I remember when I was uh, uh, last year when I was in the uh, Taiwan Korean Film Festival when I sit in the cinema, which is really nice. We are still fighting for find a better, uh, you know, like a, how to say it, the projector. So every time I say, oh, who has better projector? We can show the film, you know. But I have to say we're missing seeing this, seeing the film in a big cinema. And uh, yeah, I wish one day we can, you know, be able to show the film in the cinema. Thank you. Then we would have had Noshim Kwaya on uh, the panel who sadly had to be admitted to hospital. She's not doing well, um, very sad. Um, she's also on the Teddy Drury this year. Um, she is also the artistic director of Glitch uh, QT Park Film Festival in Glasgow. So uh, queer, trans, intersex, people of color film festival in Glasgow, which is brand new, had this first edition last year. Um, and you know, for obviously it's a very with a very specific idea of what kind of films to show um, to in order to um, fill a, a certain gap in representation. Also it would have been really interesting to talk about Glasgow because last year another festival was founded there um, as well, SQIF, the Scottish Queer International Film Festival. So you know Maybe there's hopefully some, some other um, way to talk about that with Nosh when she's better and back from hospital. Then we have Sadat Munir, um, who is the creative director of the binational AKS Film Art and Dialogue Festival, uh, which is basically a transnational or binational um, film festival for minorities um, both hosted in Denmark and Pakistan. Um, and he, um, before that, had also been involved with uh, Mix Copenhagen as a programmer. So, welcome, Sada. <laughs> and uh, we already heard a bit about um, the very, you know, the specificity of cultural context, uh, regional um, context, political context, and I think that's also extremely interesting with your new festival that you just founded, looking at minorities or marginalization both in Denmark and Pakistan. Maybe you can say a bit about that idea. Hello, um, can you hear me? Uh, first of all, I would just like to add in, uh, it's called AX, not AKS, so AX actually means reflection in Urdu language and also <coughs> in Hindi and many other languages. Uh, yeah, so that's what I think that. Uh, well, regarding my festival, uh, I'm, I'm still um, kind of uh, confused if we, if, we, if we do exist or not, because we, we can't, in Pakistan we totally depend on, on the circumstances. Uh, it's, a, it's a festival where we really have to work carefully uh, through the community and, and work a, in, in a position there where we have to take lots of responsibilities and using the right word and not uh, offending anyone that, that can cause us trouble. Uh, on the other side, in Copenhagen, um, uh, although I, I love Mix and uh, it's been doing a lot of uh, lot of good work in, in, in regard with LGBTIQ uh, uh, work and film and art, but uh, we 
just feel that um, there should be even more focus on uh, uh, LGBTIQ uh, films that can even focus on uh, 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 issues or topics like uh, queer people of color and the global south. So, 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 yeah, that's why we started in Copenhagen as well. So we can just think that more is less. So we're going to have a last one. Thanks. And last but not least, on the other side of the panel, we have Jürgen Brüning, uh, who. Uh, <laughs> He's been around for a while um, as a <laughs> film producer and uh, curator for several festivals. Um, he's the founder of the Pont Film Festival in Berlin. Uh, he's probably best known also as producer of the uh, Bruce LaBruce films, but also for um, Cheryl Denis films. Um, he's also been curating for the uh, Lesbian Gay Film Festival in Berlin in the 90s, uh, but also for uh, Interfilm, the Short Film Festival, Documentary Film Festivals in Leipzig and Neubrandenburg, and also for the Panorama here. So uh, he's been in the business for a long, long time. Um, since um, you already mentioned in your little statement that the um, Porn Film Festival in itself is not a queer festival per se, but still um, connected to uh, another maybe sub-circuit of, of other porn slash erotic um, festivals, Cine King, um, Pop Porn and Sao Paulo, <laughs> Perf in Melbourne. Um, maybe you can talk a bit about um, the intersection or the relation between those festivals, also the Porn Film Festival and LGBTQ festivals and film. You know, I wouldn't go too deep in the beginning because I think we should have a dialogue about this. I only give some facts about the Porn Film Festival or the situation in Berlin, you know. As you mentioned, you know, Wieland and the Berlinale and Salzgeber showed a lot of queer films or LGBT films for decades, you know, so, and there was no LGBT festival in Berlin. I founded it with some other people in 1993. Um, and we stopped after three years because um, I decided or I had the feeling that I'm not showing the films the LGBT community was interested in. So I thought, why should I do a festival they don't want and films they don't want to see? So we stopped. And I uh, founded the uh, Porn Film Festival in 2006. And as you know, um, I'm known for working with Bruce LaBruce who calls himself a reluctant pornographer. I'm, I'm an open pornographer, you know, I have no problems with this. So. And the Porn Film Festival, I would say, shows films which uh, show a diverse range of sexual expressions of, non, of human and non-human identities, you know, so. And the other focus, of course, is, uh, uh, you know, Porn has this cliché image that there is not a well-balanced uh, representation of female desire in the porn industry. So our focus is also to show a lot of female identity filmmakers in our festival and we nearly reach our goal of have half of the filmmakers are female identified. And the third focus, of course, is that we are looking for cultural landscapes uh, films from cultural landscapes where sexuality is oppressed, marginalized, censored or so, you know, that, uh, and that's a very hard task to really find people and what we of course endure then is when we, for example, would like to show an Iranian film which deals with uh, sexuality there and when we asked uh, and they said they say for example we cannot show the film in your festival because it's called porn film festival and of course we have to accept that then too thanks so now that everybody's introduced we have a bit of background and we already had a little bit of a uh, start of a conversation over lunch and uh, one thing that came up for everybody was well what is queer 
film, the queer festival at all. So if one of you guys wants to jump in and maybe explain for your context, um, first of all, do you use queer as a term or rather LGBT or something else? And, and what would that be for you in terms of your, your festival? I can start. Uh, I think in the beginning, the, our film festival called the Beijing Homosexual Film Festival. So I think because of the, you know, the queer, the term in Chinese, when they translate to Chinese, become like a, it's like a cool, it's not like a queer. The words have been, become like very, like not queer at all. But the homosexual is really queer because it's really right on your face and you just feel like, oh, if you say homosexual, it's like people are like, wow, you're queer. So this is why in the beginning we tried to use the homosexual because that's more like uh, shocking people. But after the first year, because you know, we, we, you know, we, we've been sort of like chasing, so we have to change our name. So we changed to Beijing Queer Film Festival because queer, the garment, they does not know what that means. So we're just like, they're just like, you know, if you say homosexual, they know what it means. But if you say queer, they don't know what you mean. So we kind of been saved quite a few years because they don't know what the queer means. But now they know what the queer means. But yeah. So, but we also, I think it's good because we, after we change queer, actually we more feel like we relate to the queer than homosexuality, you know, homosexual. Because uh, I think we, our film festival, because most are activists, so we, we always, feel like you know we have to bring we have to bring the film first if we talk about the activism in around the world in, in China in Asia and also we like to film as kind of more like a uh, challenge the normativity so I think that's kind of our film festival uh, also like uh, more and more related to the queer this world yeah and I think we have the same thing I mean um People don't really what, know what queer means, so we got the chance to get some money because of that and because of having feminism in front. So somehow, although we see it as an umbrella term, it kind of was an advantage for us, whereas uh, the case in which we would have called it LGBT or even uh, homosexual or, or lesbian, that would have, would have, would have been a, a mistake. So it's also called queer in the native term of the festival? Sorry? In, like in, in, in Romanian, in like the, the original language name of the festival no, is also called queer? There's no original name. Uh -huh. So it is in the English title, okay. Queer, weird, they would translate it like that. Um, speaking for Frameline, it's, it's been interesting over the years that the name of the festival has changed. So when it first started, it was again started by gay men, so the name of the festival was gay. And then about four or five years later, it, we added lesbian. And then um, 10 years ago, I guess 11 years ago, Frameline 29, we added the B and the T to the acronym because if you were to spell out San Francisco International Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, Transgender Film Festival, it would be very long. Um, <laughs> And then, um, you know, again, this question about representation and burden and, and really centering inclusivity as well as underrepresented folks, we added the Q last year. Now, we had an interesting conversation at lunch about, well, why isn't it queer? And so, speaking from um, a North American perspective, a lot of our um, resources um, have to do with, um, you know, different funding streams. Whether it's foundations, whether it's government grants, which are which are much smaller, but we rely um, also as a festival on individual members. A lot of our members, and I'm just gonna, as Cheryl said, speaking truth, a lot of our members look a certain way. They um, happen to be um, older gay men of a certain age, and the word queer does not resonate with them. So uh, we find that you know strategically. Yes, we interchangeably use the phrase queer and LGBTQ, um, and we're also looking at um, you know, serving younger audiences who embrace the word queer, but um, we have found that even in San Francisco, it's still a very polarizing word, so um, internally, we, we switch it up and, and use them interchangeably, but currently the title is LGBTQ. Which is interesting as, you know, on the one hand it's a counter term, on the other hand now if you add it on it becomes its own identity, so yeah, lots of uh, discourse uh, going on there, yeah. but Sadat was 
gonna Yeah, answer. I mean, it's almost the same as uh, you have a situation in uh, Romania, China. But, but uh, since our festival, we are a very underground festival. We don't really do any public uh, announcement of our festival, or it's not at all public. So, so it's, all, it's mostly directed toward um, our collaborators, as in, uh, in pa especially in Pakistan, collaborators as in uh, foreign embassies. Or, or the community members. So for community members, we, it's sometimes easier to use the word LGBT because it's something they have heard about. But, and I, I've, I've just had this experience say, uh, while communicating with the American embassy in Pakistan and, and they, they couldn't really understand the word queer. Uh, and they asked me like several times, are you gonna show any LGBT films? So, so but, but in our paperwork, we try to use the terminologies more as in uh, transgender and sexual minorities. Uh, transgender, as you may know, in Pakistan, uh, they have a law for, tra uh, for third gender, so the transgender is the only alternative gender uh, which is accepted. So, and they, uh, the transgender community work more, more as in umbrella term, so so rest of the LGBT can can be covered easily underneath. Uh, but you can't be local about LGB. So 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 we try to mend it more like uh, transgender and sexual minorities. So 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 we don't get into any troubles there. Uh, and in Copenhagen, uh, we are free to use whichever word we would like to. But we we are more comfortable using the word queer. And especially queer trans people of color, uh, that goes with more and more. Now I would uh, say something. So you know, we had a, uh, a talk at the lunch about it, and when I remember correctly, I think you said it or somebody said it. You know, a porn festival you can only do in Berlin. You know, I don't agree with this. And um, but you know, of course, the porn film festival in a way is a queer festival and it's not a queer festival. I would say, you know, when you, people who have been at the festival know it's the most queer festival in the world, I would say, on one side. But, um, you know, for me, when, I'm listen, when I was listening to Christine Vachon, for example, when she was talking about, you know, doing an experimental film like Poison and in 1991, all the gay and lesbian or gay guys would go and watch it. Nowadays, they wouldn't because it's too experimental, you know. So I was also, you know, a, a lot of like gay films didn't don't didn't speak to me, and I wanted to be more open. So that's the reason why I said I'm doing a film um, which is open to any kind of sexual expression, and also. What I learned, you know, doing my life, you know, is that, for example, when you see something like fetish sexual role play, you know, uh, it's not important what kind of identity you have because it's about submission and domination. So these kind of labels wouldn't work in our festival. Of course, in our program, we have certain kind of labels to give the audience an orientation, but. The festival, what we can do, of course, in a very post-capitalistic urban environment like Berlin is to, uh, to have a public space where all these people can mix and even a straight man can endure to see two gay guys fucking or two uh, gay guys see hot lesbian fisting sex, for example, and this works in our festival. And for me, it works in this way because there is a dialogue between everybody, and that's very important, I think. Yeah, uh, also, what I was saying about uh, this idea that it's, for me, it's more important the way you look at a film than what it's exactly about. I, I find it really narrowing as a, as a film programmer this idea that I'm programming for a certain community or for certain communities because I don't want uh, specific people just because of their sexuality to watch just these films 
and uh, and also these films shouldn't be just shown to to these specific people. I mean, it, it, it's it's also um, it's very narrowing creatively as a, as a programmer to do that, and I don't think it's interesting to to build a festival uh, on this uh, on this concept. It's much more interesting that you find other realities also beside your own, and that you build your you build your identity, you and you get to know the world through everything that's going around, and you're not close inside these these concepts, which are and also I mean. In, uh, in many of the films, they're always repeating the same stereotypes. Th this is not good. So it's really, it's really challenging to suddenly find a film that has no gay, lesbian, a trans a narrative in it, but that the audience is overwhelmed by it. And it, it, it's, on, it's on a queer festival, and it's probably the first time it's been in a queer festival, and people are surprised to see it, and they, they like seeing it there. I think that's, that's a really good challenge, and I think that's the way the, the festivals should uh, should go. And um, so, for me, that's the problem with, with the LGBTQ um, categorization. I, I, at this point, I really don't think it's useful for, for anyone. It's, um, I, I, want, I want the G to go and watch the L films, and I want the T to go and watch the the G films, and sometimes if people are confused and they don't know exactly what it's about, better. So be surprised by 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 something something you find in the in the, in the film program. Well, if I if we specifically follow up on that, right? It comes if we follow up on on what you just said. It's the typical. Um, dualism that's coming out when you talk about LGBT slash Q film festivals is is it about activism and community building or is it about cinephilia, right? And then, or how do you mix that? How do you, you know, where is the where is the way that you navigate, like, depending probably on the context that you were in, like, what and you know that would be my general question, maybe for another round before we then open up, is who are you programming for and why? So the very basic questions, right? Like who's your audience, and what do you want to achieve with putting out a certain kind of film that then addresses a certain kind of audience? So audiences and mission, maybe just. Can I just add something? I think, you know, uh, in a different country, I think you have a different, like, situation. For, I, I think that some, like, for me, a lot of identity, like, queer identity, or gay or straight, there, for me, it's more like a political identity. It's not like a sexuality identity. So I think sometimes, also, film festival, also, in certain country, in a different situation, they also have this identity. So they have, I feel like they are have this, uh, you know, be, to be queer, to be LGBT, and also have to stand out like this identity, calling people. There's something different from the, the, the main society. So I think that, you know, it's, because sometimes I do feel like a, uh, there's a, uh, we have a lot of discussion inside too, you know, how we can be queer, how we can be LGBT. I think sometimes it's not, not one side. When the Queer Film Festival become too much about like, uh, we don't want everyone, if you don't understand me, you cannot come. I think during that time maybe we need self critic. But when we only go that way, but we still have to come back. So I think sometimes the movement is like you have to always to go and come back, go and come back. That is not one way to do. And the, they have to see this or they have to see that or we have to cross. It's not necessary. But I do think, you know, for, uh, for us program, we have to be able. Uh, I think it's because uh, thinking as an activist, sometimes you, you have to see this, how this discussion or those because I think Beijing sometimes, I do feel like, uh, that, for example, especially the gay men like, uh, movement, sometimes can be very mainstream. People are very, very like to go to middle class, dress nice, go to bar, and uh, even sometimes they don't really care about the movement because they get everything they, they need, it, so they do. Actually, only, actually sometimes the queer film class, we can see most of the people come are like, you know, uh, actually our film class are more like a female, only this like very, 
you know, if you put like a, a very mainstream film of her, there's a lot of like a gay man will come. But generally, we, we have a lot of queer films actually. Sometimes, you know, they don't like to come. They always complain, oh, this film is just like, oh, why? What do you try to talk about? Like, uh, you know, why does that talk about like a normal life? And, uh, and sorry, I'm being a bit like a messy, but I just, yeah, make me thinking those questions, yeah. Thank you for um, bringing, I think, context in terms of location and how, you know, yes, we're all centering art, but at the same time, um, it's, it's very different for each of us. So um, I'd like to think as a film curator, um, you know, I'm a conduit in connecting the art and the artists with the audience. And in that, um, yeah, the first festival for Frameline was very much an act of, of revolution in terms of folks desiring to see their experiences, reflections of themselves centered on the screen. And I think that's why so many um, identity-based festivals exist, because we go back to what Christine was saying, just even about mainstream Hollywood films, and it's just like, what about the guy? What about, and let's take that a step further, what about the straight white guy? And where does that leave everyone else that's not whoever is, I don't even remember who played Julianne Moore's husband in that movie. I don't care, I just, actually. Um, but I, I think in terms of Frameline, you know, we're also acutely aware that the queer film art we curate has a very powerful ripple effect. It sparks dialogues, it deepens existing conversations, it also introduces emerging artists to the world. So in terms of who our audience is, I think at the festival, um, it's definitely much, uh, folks that live in the San Francisco Bay Area, as well as, you know, I'm aware of how many folks come to our festivals to scout for content. So I feel like there's a balance there in terms of both programming for our local audience and wanting to make sure that we're setting up each film successfully, as well as wanting to provoke them, wanting to ruffle their feathers, wanting to um, have them think outside of their own lived experience and, and make sure that, that that mixing of experiences, so people often ask me, oh, what should I see at the festival? I, I, I usually ask them, well, what do you like? And I, and I give them recommendations on that sense. And then I completely challenge them to go see two or three films about parts of our communities that they know nothing about. Things that they were like, I don't know that I would like that. Great, you should really go see that. Um, so I think, I think it's a balance. And I think through the, the art that we're exhibiting, that's where the activism comes in at this point for where we're at in the organization's life cycle. Um, no. I think I'm in, in a very privileged position because, you know, me as a curator, you know, I have um, nearly 40 years of, um, experience as, uh, of a, as a curator. And I have curated also in non-queer context festivals like for example the Leipzig documentary festival where I started uh, in 1991 just after the fall of the wall um, I was in a very hetero eastern uh, normative context and of course at me as a privileged gay white male person I tried to put more other diversity into this and out of this, you know, uh, as I said before, I did the LGBT festival in 1993 in Berlin and I stopped it because, you know, it didn't work for me. And the Porn Film Festival is like my curatorial child and I'm a very egoistic person, so I program what I like and I give a shit what the audience thinks. So, and... I did it the first year by myself, but then I opened it up because, you know, I thought, you know, to torture the world only with my perspective is a little bit boring, so I asked some other people to come in. So now we are a collective of five people, male and female, lesbian and straight or so, and we have long fights, and we still have the, uh, the thing that, you know, everybody of us in the collective can program when he or she thinks that the film is important to them to put it in the program, you know. And I have to say, you know, we are very lucky because, you know, we have an appreciative audience, but we are a totally elitist festival, you know, so for a very marginalized community here in Berlin, and we have a total of 7,000 tickets in five days, which is like a minority, minority, minority. So I would say so. And so it's our playground and 
Manuela and Klaus, are you here? We are happy doing it. And I hope our audience is happy with doing it uh, and coming to the festival. Well, um, when it comes to the curatorial part, uh, we are relatively new in Pakistan. Uh, we are relatively new in Pakistan. <laughs> so uh, our focus is more to, to build uh, some sort of community back home. And uh, uh, since transgender community is, uh, is somehow established community in Pakistan, uh, although they are ostracized community, but, but, but there is a large number of transgender community in Pakistan, especially transgender women community. And they're considered uh, outcast of the society. So uh, for, for this year of festival, we are actually trying to do a few public screenings where we will screen uh, just hetero docu heteronormative documentaries, where are, which, are, which are popular in Pakistan. People haven't had a chance to see them but we will invite people to see those films, but at the same time we will create a transgender visibility during those screenings so they can sit along trans community and, and have the feeling of visibility of transgender community in Pakistan so that can, that can create some sort of dialogue. So, so it's more of a political activism we, we, we try to create in Pakistan that, that where we can, we can actually bring to uh, uh, parted communities together, so 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 there should be at least a little hope for some sort of dialogue in, in Pakistan. I'm just curious. To, I'm asking each of you, how do you keep your team together? <laughs> I, uh, we've been having like uh, problems with that, and I'm curious about advices on how to keep your team together. How do you keep people in terms of burnout or in terms of yeah. Because burnout's real, we all know that. Yeah, burnout and like... Be nice to each other. <laughs> I definitely think acknowledging everybody's contributions. Um, we're, we're very blessed in that we have, you know, a, a year-round team and then we have a seasonal team. And at the end of the day, everybody's opinion is important, everybody's contributions are important, and whoever, you know, everybody's working as, in my experience on my team, everybody's working as hard as they can to put on the big show, to, to create this um, transformative space for people to come and, and take in the art. And so I think sometimes, even if, if we're stressed, if we've had a very difficult phone call with a distributor or a filmmaker, or the print is somewhere that we don't know where it is. Um, just acknowledge everyone's contributions, especially you know the volunteers, the people that aren't getting paid or aren't getting paid enough, or you know doing this in addition to a thesis and raising children or you know leading an NGO. But I think you know acknowledging everyone's contributions and and really at the end of the day knowing that people are doing the best they can. Uh, uh, in, in my project, I think uh, uh, we just need to find like-minded, like crazy people who are actually willing to do something like that. So I, I think there are many of us out there. So uh, yeah, so it's we we just try to appreciate each other's work once in a while, and, and yeah. Um, it, I get, the reality is different for all of us. I mean, we're, uh, World, we're a state-funded uh, festival, so we have um, we have a team that uh, uh, works all year long, has contracts, and uh, and uh, there's also people working seasonally just for just for for six months. And um, yeah, we just I guess we just try to be to do our best work and uh, and have fun and. Uh, that's it. But of course, the, the, the money helps. It, it's uh, it's it's an it's a very important element to keep a team together for and for continuing to, uh, working there. Um, at Beijing Core Film Festival, we have actually we only have seven to nine members, so we take turn to be like a chair on duty. So each member it can take two years. So that's how everyone have a chance to really hold a whole film festival to, to show their idea to be the, uh, to how to uh, program this festival. So this is how to keep our member together. 
you know, I learned something from Desiree. So we have all year round volunteers, which are the five people programming and organizing, and then we have seasonal volunteers. So nobody gets paid at the festival. And over the, so you, some of the five people are, we are already most of the time to, for the 10 years together, so we know each other very well. So we love each other, we hate each other, we fight, but what uh, is always very good is this intensive discussions about the program, which brings us closer sometimes or sometimes not. And what we did last year, you know, you have to do this. We did it the old fashioned way. We, we went away for a weekend, we cooked, we ate, we smoked dope and talked. That was really good, you know. So. <laughs> All right, um, I would have certain questions if there aren't any from the audience, but looking at the time, there are probably people who want to ask questions or make comments, so... I was just wondering how other festivals work, like, because Joao said that uh, money is very important to keep a team together. And I was wondering about other festivals, like, how, like, how does it work, like, do people get paid or... How is it, like with volunteer work or, yeah, thanks. Maybe just, I can just quickly tell my experience. Um, I've been working in the, uh, in the festival for 14 years and I've been through all the stages, uh, doing it with zero euros on the account to, to having, uh, to being state funded regularly for, for the past um, uh, eight, nine years at least, regularly, as we've been before. Um, I mean, my, my answer would be, you can do it with or, without, with or without money. It's just better to do it with money. <laughs> it's, um, you, it, it, of course, it, it changes. It changes the way you, you program. It changes um, how many people you can have uh, on the team and uh, the, the work relations. It, it, it's all different. But yeah, we, we always manage to keep our to keep going on, to keep our identity as a festival for 20 years, always happening in the same months every year, with money and without money. So it's really, it's, it's always possible. And thankfully you have, always have a, a lot of generous people who, who want to contribute and uh, who, who, who help out when, when, when you need it. So yeah. Um, I started in this wonderful world of queer film festivals as an intern at Outfest as part of my um, undergraduate work. And then I volunteered for them as a pre-screener. And then I moved to the Bay Area and jumped on the festival circuit doing print traffic and programming at about five Bay Area film festivals. Um, and then was you know, given the opportunity to join a very talented team. Um, of, of year-round staff at Frameline. So in addition to the festival, we also distribute queer film and we help fund queer film. Um, so our year-round team is about nine people and seasonally we bring on about 20 part-time uh, seasonal contracts. But I will also say we have 500 volunteers to help produce a festival that brings in... Yeah, and so then I think it's important to talk about budget. So our overall budget, and again, I again, acknowledge I'm coming from a, a capitalist country that's, that's slightly different and, and from a place of privilege, I think, in, in, in resources compared to some of our other colleagues. Um, so our operating budget, including in-kind, is 1.5 million, um, which compared to the General Interest Festival, the General Interest Festival in San Francisco, um, their operating budget, I believe, is two to three times as large as ours, so. What is your budget? Our budget is very a little bit uh, through the years, but it's always around 140,000 euros. In Portugal? <laughs> <laughs> so, our budget is 30,000 euros, and we have 100 visiting filmmakers to uh, accommodate, you know, with our small budget. Well done, sir. Okay, <laughs> talking about, our is actually two billion dollars now. <laughs> now uh, well, we are completely dependent on donations, so 
Uh, we are going to have our festival in April. Uh, we have been lucky enough to win uh, a donation from, from Holland, um, which will support our festival. That's like 7,500 euros. But the money, uh, all our events are for free of cost, so, so they are for the community. And uh, we provide transportation, we provide food, we provide uh, local artists to showcase their art. So, so, so whatever money we get, we try to spend the whole money on community for the community building sake. And we are a non-commercial festival and we don't, actually we do not exist in Pakistan in, in documents, we exist only in Copenhagen. So don't tell anyone. Um, yeah. So yeah, and uh, we have been even more luckier that we have got support from Hamburg, Kuroki. Uh, that's a, you know, an event in Hamburg. They have also donated some money to us. So yeah. So we are still looking for funds, looking for donations, and we are free of cost. And we provide food and transportation. If you come to Copen Pakistan, so we'll give you free transportation to the film screenings, and food as well. Maybe I can add uh, the, the numbers about uh, the Hamburg Film Festival, because I've been on the board for many years, and I've written a dissertation about queer film festivals, so I know the numbers very well. Um, and it's also an interesting festival, because it's pretty big. It's six days, has 15,000 people and audiences, and has a budget of almost a quarter million now, so 250,000. Um, interestingly though, mostly still volunteer collective work. There are only two people who are have part-time jobs, so you know, not, not a professional hierarchical structure at all. Um, which is, you know, deliberately so, like, um, as a political act, there is uh, the urge to keep it a collective. Um, but that also means, that sounds like a lot of money, but it's not necessarily going into high salaries or anything. It's also going into screening fees, is going into bringing uh, guests, is going into venues and the like, and a third of that money actually comes our ticket sales, which is also an important thing, you need to um, program at least once you're in pretty old big festivals, the same for Frameline, you need to program also films that put bumps into seats, so to speak, so you can uh, cross-finance films where you know that not that many people are going to go, so that's also an, a part that might be interesting to think about, you know, about money issue in terms of programming. But are there any other questions in the back there? Yeah. I want just to share uh, a thought with all you programmers because we talk about how you put films together and you make a festival. I followed Teddy the last 10 years and uh, every year, the last five years, is getting harder uh, because we don't have the budget as Portugal and Hamburg to take a film. Uh, for example, this year I'm like, okay, I'm going to see the films that are attending, but now the Teddy selected a film, if it is official selected Teddy, it has been so expensive and they don't even bother to give to a gay lesbian film festival. I remember the first thing that I got very angry, it was a few years ago with Call Me Kuchu. You know that I called and I said, uh, we screened the film, we request, and they said, Oh, you have to wait to see if the other athletes in the National Film Festival will take, the Saloniki will take, and we will see. And I said, excuse me, this guy died for LGBT rights. I mean, what, what? I don't understand. You make a world that's so important, and at the end, you make the LGBT festival so small, somehow. I don't know if you share my thoughts, but I really believe we, we, we have worked all this year all together, you know. Now they buy a lot of LGBT films, many... Uh, distribution companies, and at the end, this film, they cannot be screened in LGBT festivals. You know, they, they don't give it. You know, or the amount they charge, it's, uh, you cannot touch them. So this is uh, some thought uh, I want to share with you. Thank you. Thanks, Tommy. Scotty, Scotty, can I say something to this, you know, so 
You know, Maria, I do understand you, but you know, we had also talked about this at the lunch, you know, about is it necessary that, for example, you know, LGBT festivals need premieres or so, you know. Like a film like Comic Kucho, you know, you have to face the reality, okay. So there's a stupid sales agency and think, you know, they can make money. But it doesn't matter if you show the film five years later, it's still an important film five years later, so you can show it five years later in essence and pay a hundred euro instead of five hundred euros for a premiere. So I don't know why, you know, I wouldn't get upset about this. This is how the world works. Everybody wants to make money, especially in film or so, you know. So make your program which you think is appropriate for your cultural landscape in essence or in India or in Pakistan, you know. Thank you. Can I reply to that? I'm sorry, uh, I may have to disagree on this one. Uh, we, we, uh, in Pakistan, because we are not predicting our, our five years, if we get caught by police or, or the government, so we don't have it in any fifth year or the second or the third year. So, so, so whatever amount of time we have, how, however we can survive in that, that region, we, we want to bring the right films and also be curators. I think sometimes it's important for us to, to, to spread the message which we feel for, which, we, which is closer to our hearts. It's, it's not a matter of premieres of the film, it's actually a matter of how do you curate those films and what, what message are you trying to spread out there. So, so if I want to, let's say for instance, I want to screen the Call Me Kuchu there, I actually want to, sh it's not about that particular title, it's actually about uh, showing what the situation is in Uganda. Uh, is it, uh, yeah, it, what the situation is in Uganda about uh, LGBTIQ people and how can it be related to, to, to be screened in Pakistan or in Copenhagen. So, so, so I, don't, I don't know I, if, if it is translated as in premieres, it's, it's more of uh, what do we want to say or what kind of message we want to spread through those films. More questions? Uh, I am from Turkey. We are organizing queer film festival since five years. Uh, I want to ask that uh, how you position yourself, uh, your festivals in cultural in, in industry? Uh, because, yes, uh, if you show the film as an activist, you have to position yourself in a cultural industry about labor rights and, and, and other rights as well. Uh, but if you are uh, queer, how do you identify yourself and how do you position your, uh, your festival in cultural industry? My question is this. Can I? Okay. I can speak for, from, from, from my festival point of view. Uh, I, I, I see uh, Pakistan as a, uh, as, as a country where those kind of topics cannot be uh, accommodated in any kind of uh, platform. So, so through films, art and dialogue, so at least we are trying to create some sort of political movement which, uh, which can maybe later on be uh, a foundation of something that we actually don't hope or don't see it can be happening like uh, Pakistan getting LGBT rights because of the uh, countries driven by the Islamic laws, uh, but but still, is, if we can create some sort of dialogue on on those topics, uh, so so it's it's, it's more uh, we identify ourselves more as in political movement, I would say. Um, yeah. Does anyone else wanna? <laughs> We kind of like, uh, don't want to be very political, but uh, we've been pushed to very political identity. So, you know, it's like we really try to just show some films, which we can. It just really make us think about, actually, when, uh, there's a really funny thing uh, one of uh, a form of my colleague made, I think, in the Communist Party, when they start, they have to build three things. One is the airline, one is like a national flag, and third is the uh, national film festival. So they see the film festival as a really important one. So this is why they kind of like, the, if the uh, film festival are, uh, you know, not controlled by the government, I think they find it really a threat. So also Beijing Queer Film Festival is the longest independent film festival in China. 
so it, it was uh, it was already been 15 years, and uh, we have to change our name. Now you know I'm talking about Beijing Queer Film Festival. Actually, in China, there still have a Beijing Queer Film Festival name there, but actually we kind of uh, how to say we're operating now like a love queer cinema way. So which is less sensitive because you have to change the name constantly, so you don't get like a on the radar. So you know, but uh, you know, here of course I'm talking about the Beijing Queer Film Festival. We know this is a history until today, but actually now we use the name called Love Queer Cinema Week. So and we're also changing time all the time. Sometimes we say September, but there's a big national meeting that we change to October. If there's something happened there, we push. You know, it's like a. There's, I think our identity is very kind of flexible. As long as we can put film on, and the people, people always will find us. So, I think in um, I think in terms of Frameline's identity, it, it is definitely, um, you know, we're one of the. Yes, we're an identity-based festival, but we're also one of the largest film festivals in the United States. We have an attendance of between sixty to sixty-five thousand people per year over eleven days. So it's. It's a bit of a queer beast, if you will. Um, and we're also the largest LGBTQ um, arts gathering um, in in the state. Um, and you know, so I think I think in terms of when I, when I think of what is Frameline's cultural identity, it's definitely rooted within queer culture versus Bay Area or American culture. Um, at least that's how I've always thought of it, but also when I, every time I come here I talk to our colleagues and I'm just like, oh wow, like, sometimes I'm just so damn American I don't even realize it. Um, so, but I, but I will just say that, that it's, it's, it's really, I think, a, going back to your previous question of, you know, activism and, and cinephilia, it's really a, a film, at, at this point I think it's become about the films. And yes, people are getting um, exposed to different um, topics or social justice issues or identities that they weren't thinking about. Um, so I, I think that's a something I need to think further about about what what is our cultural identity beyond film and queer. I think we have time for a couple more questions because we started late, but. Also then soon there are more and more people arriving in the back, so there will be the big queer program as we see later. But since we're still here, everybody seems still happy to listen or ask questions if you want. Yeah. Dagmar from the Hamburg Queer Film Festival. Just to follow up on the question on cultural and industries, that's a term from as you know, Horkheimer Adorno's Dialectic der Aufklärung, which they both wrote in exile uh, on, as refugees from the Nazis when they came to Hollywood and had this incredible shock. And, um, and Adorno also said, es gibt kein richtiges Leben im Falschen, so there's no right way of life in the wrong life, and we all live in the wrong life. It's capitalism. So, and there is no way to avoid that right now, as long as it, it exists. But there are different ways of navigating to it. And I don't think that you could actually have this kind of equation of, oh, DIY festivals are sort of the best. They have the best heart, and commercial or like festivals which have a big budget are like evil <laughs> because they are not. Because, <laughs> for instance, the Hamburg Film Festival, it might sound like like they have a big budget, but I mean, as you, as we also heard, nobody earns money, and I mean, everybody works there for free. Most of the people in the team, I'm not on the team, I'm just a programmer, but the 10 people on the team and some of them there work all year round working their ass off to create this program and then they don't take any money because they want to be able to pay screening fees to the filmmakers and to have guests coming in to, yeah, to allow people from other countries to be part of the festival and to have this exchange going on. And a festival like Frameline, but also Outfest in LA, I mean they are big budget festivals, it sounds like that, but then on the other hand they are also they are showcasing films that we, which we wouldn't know otherwise. So they are actually filmmaking is a very expensive profession. So you have like distributors and so on. So you need these big festivals in order to be able to screen the films later on on smaller festivals. So there is it's not like there is this kind of competition of good and bad and so on and evilness. We all live in this shitty system. And <laughs> it's rather like we've been able to reach out to each other and, and yeah, 
acknowledging the contribution that each festival does and acknowledging the diversity and variety. Maybe following up on that um, advertisement for the fabulousness of queer film festivals. Um, it's also maybe, you know, like a, a very positive side, but also with a little, uh, you know, um, critical tinge maybe is also that since there are that many and big queer film festivals around that they are now in a certain way um, somewhat an alternative system of exhibition, right? I mean, there are a lot of films that travel the circuit to a couple of hundred festivals now, if they're, if they're good films, so that's an, in, in, in one way good in terms of circulating ideas, but also circulating film as a product and help filmmakers in a way that Jürgen probably can talk about as a producer later if he wants to. Another thing that I find quite interesting is that move from actively selecting certain kind of film, but also uh, if you know if you have the feeling like certain stuff is not submitted, um, like how on the one hand go actually actively search for content, but also what uh, for instance Frameline has been doing in other film festivals as well is try to support filmmakers actually by giving out money as in the completion fund as Frameline does or Outfast has a script lab I think still. Um, so you know the, the active part that the festival circuit is playing in creating film and creating a film culture which is also a you know an, an important bit that also goes beyond the LGBT activism issue maybe. Would be something one could talk about if we wanted to. Maybe Jürgen, do you want to add something as a producer on that side, maybe, or or is it are we too far off already? So. Um, you know, it's, it was very interesting for me to listen to Christine. You know, because I I met Christine, I think in 1983 or four in New York when she was with Apparatus and Todd and Tom were not known filmmakers and we both were not even producers or, you know. So, and she makes it into Hollywood and I'm doing low budget film. But as an example, you know, for a producer of course it's, uh, it's important to make a little bit of money with the film and I can tell you but times have changed like in 1996 I did or 1995 I did Hustler White with Bruce and Hustler Weiss is the most successful, commercially successful film Bruce did, you know, we had theatrical release in France, in America and we actually made money but when I'm putting out a film now, or even Bruce is doing a bigger film, John Tophelia there are not so many people watching his films anymore, you know it's because of the structure, how films are, are seen now or that people are not interested in more different work or so you know and it definitely doesn't cross over anymore and the only chance to show your gay content is in LGBT festivals and that's for me then the only source of income I have you know so as me as a very independent producer I'm really depending on income from LGBT festivals to make more film. I uh, thank you for sharing that because I, I think it brings up the question as well as Dagmar's comments about you know the system and at the end of the day we're all in a film ecosphere the filmmakers ev and everybody needs more money everybody needs more money um, and it's true um, at the end of the day the filmmakers should ideally getting paid for their work everybody in this room should be getting ideally paid for their work as well and at the end of the day sometimes there are these just you know tough resources of like, okay, I would love to have the artist here. I don't have the budget to do that. So it's amazing that, that you can bring in 100 filmmakers for, for your festival. But I think it's also working creatively, working strategically, um, building those alliances. Um, I know many people often email me like, oh, this distributor isn't responding. Who do you know there? And I think, you know, 
seeing the abundance of festivals and seeing how we can all be allies and colleagues together and working together versus, you know, and I, and I think it's tricky in certain markets, there's several festivals. We were trying to figure out how many were in Berlin and San Francisco, and I really feel like there's four film festivals a weekend in San Francisco. At the end of the day, we, we all can help build those bridges, make those introductions. Um, if there's an amazing new short and I hear that someone is adapting that into a feature, I want to tell kind of everybody I know about it. That way they can help raise those funds. But I think, I think it's challenging when the larger system is set up to you know, pay our artists as well as they should be paid, but at the same time, we need to ensure that our festivals are sustainable. Nobody wants to be going into debt or losing money in doing this because we want to have the next edition happen. Well, now that we're at the bottom uh, line and down to reality, maybe that's the perfect way to close and lead over to the uh, um, practice uh, industry section of the Queer Programmers meeting after this. Um, I thank everybody on the panel for being here. Thanks uh, to the audience uh, for holding out this long and participating. And um, yeah, thank you. Thank you.